Thank you for being here. Really appreciate the opportunity. I really enjoy the, the, the chance to get it connected to a group of folks that, uh, that are going to change the world. That'll be you. And by definition, from folks who are joining the workforce today, there's a neat opportunity to really make a difference. You know, there's a lot of research. In fact, Net Impact and Rutgers did a great study recently that showed that the generation of folks graduating right now care about making a difference with their careers more than any generation that's graduated in their, during their, uh, their time of, of study, which is interesting because, you know, I, I've heard a, a comment from folks who said that people in the baby boom generation spent their entire career trying to be successful and then they're spending their retirement trying to be relevant. What, you guys have the opportunity to put those things together. You figured it out a lot faster than a lot of us have. And you put it together and said, you know what? What I want to do is make a difference while I'm making a living. And in fact, I want to do those things together. And I want to I use that as an opportunity to commit my career to an opportunity to make a difference. And I think that's, it, statistically, that's you. I'll presume you all are in that category. And um, that really is a neat, neat thing. You know, I, I, I had the opportunity uh, when I went to college, I, I'm also a recovering engineer, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get better. I'm working on it. Um, when my, you know, we talked about interdisciplinary kind of view as being an important piece of what's going, of what goes forward. Um, it, so the anecdote for me is that my dad came to my brother and I in sort of high school, and my dad was an engineer, mechanical engineer undergraduate, electrical engineer graduate, was a senior engineer with IBM, led some pretty big um, engineering development programs for the corporation, came to my brother and I early and said, I want you guys to be happy. I want you guys to know that you can do anything you want with your lives. You can do anything. You can, when you just start with college, for example, you guys could go to college and you can major in anything you want. You could be electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, <laughs> chemical engineers industrial engineers, aerospace engineers, the world is your oyster. You could, so, yeah, you can see where we ended up, both of us. Uh, it, was, it was cool. It was good. Then later I found out that there was other people in the world who actually didn't graduate with engineering degrees, and they couldn't talk. They, they had no way of communicating with people like me. So a, a whole big part of my career was figuring out how to talk to people who didn't talk like me. And that was actually pretty important. And eventually, it became an important part of my success in, or in organizations and what I learned about how to translate some of those business um, successes into what it meant to be thinking about the next direction of business and the next direction of where we're going. You know, um, business has a great opportunity. In fact, a lot of people think that in order to be successful, you've got to join the Peace Corps. Now, I love folks that join the Peace Corps. That's great. But really, ha having that either-or mentality is a part of the problem. And in fact, uh, perhaps you've read Paul Hawken, who started with, industrial col er, with, um, with Ecology of Commerce and has published a, a number of wonderful works, seminal works in the space. He's respected as an environmentalist, but also as a, as a person thinking about sustainable business. And he says, as an environmentalist, at least in, at the beginning, he says, business is the only human institution with the scale, speed, and resources to make a big enough difference soon enough, essentially, paraphrasing. Wow, that's pretty interesting. You know, in truth, when we look at the corporate world and the business world, we can pretty much say today that, well, business has had uh, its share of being part of the problem. Now, on the other hand, it's had a pretty good run. Let's face it, we cured polio, we have iPhones. <laughs> which are about, you know, no, no. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is that a lot of the challenges that we face today are in fact part of the challenges that business has created while it's been successful. And in fact, we've kind of had this challenge all along business. In fact, our business success has been based for quite a long time on a core belief, a conventional wisdom. The conventional wisdom is that we make a choice. It's either business success or environmental and social responsibility, one or the other. So my grandfather used to say, in order to make a cake, you got to break some eggs. That's kind of the attitude, right? It's, it's, and that attitude is baked in virtually every decision we make. How many times do we personally carry that conventional wisdom when we don't even realize it? Green products are more expensive 
and don't work as well because that's the trade-off, right? In fact, even my kind of pseudo joke of if you want to make a difference in the world, you join the Peace Corps, you don't go to business, right? I'm going to write a book about the opportunity to change the world owned uniquely by the corporate middle manager. <laughs> I know. In fact, if in, it's a balancing act, if in fact it's a choice between doing the right thing or making money, then our entire business opportunity really is about slacklining. It's about trying to figure out that balance. And frankly, nobody's really good at balance. Nature isn't even very good at balance, in fact. It's not really about balance. It's about a whole different way of thinking. In fact, when we're forced to think about trade-offs, what we end up with is compromise. And what's compromise? Compromise is not quite as good for, e for anybody who's trying to make the difference, right? So why would we accept compromise? We don't do that in the rest of our design conversation, really, right? We, what we're really driving for is the best thing we can design at the lowest cost for the best, better, faster, cheaper. That's what we're good at. That's what we get paid to do. We don't, let, ultimately, yes, we make trade-offs. But in the beginning, what we're thinking about is how do we get it all? And in fact, rejecting the notion of trade-off leads to innovation. And really, that is the key to the, whole, to the whole movement around sustainable business. Instead of thinking about the trade-offs, instead of thinking about good corporate citizens make better choices, what we really have to start thinking about is how do we redesign from the get-go such that we get different outcomes. Paraphrasing Einstein, the, the thinking that got us into the problem isn't going to solve it. Right? So this compromise conversation, this either-or conversation, comes up in lots of different contexts. Let me tell you a quick story that I experienced at REI. Early in uh, my experience at REI, we decided to look at some issues around the business. We started looking at environmental and social indicators as opportunity indicators. What if we had blind spots in the way we ran the business? And what if, looking through the lens of environmental and social responsibility at metrics along those ways, could actually indicate to us places that we maybe had missed through the conventional thinking, had missed some opportunities or perhaps some risks. One of the ways we did that was to take a look at a carbon inventory. Far from being a sort of tree-hugging exercise, this was a business exercise in understanding our business better. Sent out the troops, tried to figure out what is the carbon inventory of this organization. One of the places we spent a lot of time was on our electricity usage. And we had actually a team of grad students going through the bills, figuring out every kilowatt hour we used at every location everywhere in the country. And then we did the math to take that information and multiply it by the carbon content of the grid in that location. It's because the grid is different in lots of different places. Where you get your power it could be quite different. The result was an incredible understanding of where the company had exposure to fossil fuel, especially, carb especially um, coal and natural gas, that we had never really seen before. So we had this big cost volatility issue in our structure that we didn't even know about. And we're having, we had no management plan around. And when we started looking at it backwards, we said, wow, w is there anything else in our business that we have millions of dollars of exposure that we don't have somebody working on? Total blind spot. We started going to work on that, and we realized that you know renewables had a lot going for them. The fact that there is no carbon content, and the fact that in the future cost of wind is predictable, free. So if the future cost of wind is predictable, then actually building a wind turbine could, actually, could give you a hedge, essentially, against future cost of energy. Basically, you're forward buying your energy portfolio. We took that strategy to the market. We found places where we could buy contracts going forward for renewables that actually, although sometimes were more expensive at the beginning, actually looked like it was going to deliver us a net present value in the purchase. We ended up with over 20% of the energy for the business came from renewables through that strategy. And we joined the Green Power Partnership, got some press. It was great. I received two emails almost simultaneously as the, as the press releases went out. The first one was from a member of the co-op who based in Alaska. And he started his email with, I can't believe you sold out my co-op. 
I'm not interested in Al Gore's politics or any kind of crusade around the environment. I want you to deliver solid results as a business and pay the dividend. He had a point. So I was able to write him back and say, you know, you're right. In fact, this was a business decision. We've put six figures to the bottom line over the last 18 months because we avoided fossil fuel surcharges because we were hedged against that challenge. Great news, right? So that's a super answer for that guy. We did it from a business mindset with business rigor. However, I had gotten an email almost simultaneously from a co-op employee down in Portland who started her email with, I can't believe you sold out my co-op. If we're making money at this, Obviously, we don't really mean it. Wow, where is she coming from, right? She, in fact, when these two folks sound very different. They sound very different politically, perhaps. They sound like they have very different perspectives. In fact, they share the exact same worldview. They have much more in common than they would actually recognize in each other. They see it the same way. They've just chosen different sides. They both believe it's either or. So the challenge that we face when we look at sustainable business solutions is that challenge, breaking conventional wisdom and starting to think about things from a whole new perspective. Well, conventional wisdom really takes us to how we get there. What we've been doing for a very long time is some have coined it take, make, waste. Now, the good news is we generate value at all these different stages of that cycle but it's one direction cycle. We take stuff, we use it, and eventually we throw it away. And we usually um, don't do a very good job of that either. Wow, how much breakage is in that formula? Ultimately, that's just not gonna get it done. And in fact, we've already experienced that that's not getting it done. The world's a lot smaller place. When they can send you an iPhone picture from the factory that made your iPhone, things are changing. There's a lot more of us, the world's a lot smaller place, and well, these solu the solutions, the, the, the throw it away solution just isn't working. Where is a way? In fact, we now have businesses that are so, the, this concept of throwing stuff away from a business concept is frequently referred to as external, externalizing costs, right? We externalize the, the impacts in the environment. Well, there are businesses now that are so big that there's no such thing as externalizing. They're everywhere. You can throw it from here to there, but it's still someplace affecting the way they do business. So it's interesting that the world has become a smaller place. We can't tolerate this make-take-waste approach anymore, but there really needs to be a shift of mindset to think about what would an alternative look like. There's some wonderful work in this space. A guy named Bill McDonough and Michael Bromgarten have introduced a book called Cradle to Cradle, and actually it's 10 years old now. But they introduced this concept of, of uh, not just recycling, but in fact closed looping our material flow. They would say that there's such a thing as a natural or um, uh, organic component, which could stay constantly in cycle of making it back into dirt and re reusing it. And they argue that there's such a thing as a technical nutrient, which would be a component, a molecule, or a material that never should get thrown away. In fact, it's way too valuable to throw away. We should recover that material and keep it constantly in cycles. And so we have this really neat model, for example, of the notion of having something that actually never has a necessi necessity to get thrown away from the chemistry on up, which is really interesting. At REI, we worked on polyester recycling. Um, polyester is a you know, really good material, it's going everywhere, lots of, lots of, lots of uh, outdoor gear is made of polyester. Um, there was a big movement to make sports gear, fleece jackets out of, out of, uh, out of pop bottles. It didn't work very well. It turns out that when you made polyester clothing out of pop bottles, it doesn't feel the same as virgin material. It turns out that just grinding it up and reprocessing it, it doesn't make a very good product. Why? Well, because it's full of contaminants that we never thought about when we made the pop bottle in the first place. Because we weren't thinking about how are we going to make this thing last forever. We were thinking about how are we going to make a really cheap pop bottle. So when we finished with the pop bottle design, what we had was garbage. By slight changes in formulation and slight changes about thinking about the way we do it, we were able to take not only pop bottles but the materials themselves, take them back to companies like Unify in North Carolina or Tasian in 
uh, Japan, both of which have new chemical processes that t allow us to take that material right back to the molecular level, reconstitute it, and it actually becomes better material than virgin. What if we actually didn't need any more oil? We got all we need. It's already here. We just have to keep using it wisely. Pretty interesting concept, and I think that there's a, a lot to the design process that can, that can drive that, and what if that is the lowest cost raw material supply? That would be a really wi a big win. So what does this look like? This notion of, of designing ourselves into solutions that really solve problems instead of simply reduce the bad elements of problems. What if I told you that I was going to tell you about a textile mill? If I told you about a textile mill, chances are you'd have mental images that look like this. Lots of challenges with textile mills. Most of the time they're in places that you don't live, I don't live. They're all over the world in places where folks like that live. Who need the jobs, we argue. But on the other hand, what are the social consequences of some of the things that happen in those places? Well, there's a really neat company called Gildan, and I'll bet not a lot of folks have heard of Gildan. Multi-billion dollar multinational company, they manufacture socks and t-shirts and underwear and a lot of other basic products, white products, um, gold toe socks, sweat socks. Yes, they invented, never mind. <laughs> the, <laughs> It's recorded. See, if it wasn't recorded, I would have said the tidy whitey. But since it's not recorded, oh, oh sorry. <laughs> Gildan's done wonderful work by rethinking. They're based in Montreal, and the, the woman there is Julie Cornayer. Corne and uh, if you think it's fun to hear about people talking about sustainability in English, you should hear her do it in French. It really sounds a lot better. They've done some wonderful work rethinking the way they do things. So early in their history, they started looking at mills and started looking at energy efficiency and trading light bulbs and adding more filters to the end of the pipe to start thinking about how are we going to clean up water supplies. And what they ended up with was a situation of diminishing returns and increasing cost. Every time they wanted to increase the, the quality of water leaving the mill, it cost more money because they had to add more capital expense to figuring out how to add more filters to the end of the pipe to clean the water better. Well, that's a loser, right? So now being the better environmental performing company actually is a competitive disadvantage to their, to their business. And their mills are in places like Honduras, Guatemala, the Dominican Republic. Rethinking from the beginning, they started to rethink what they really need and what a mill might really look like. So you can't talk about factories and mills without talking about the people that work in them. But what if a mill started delivering a whole different type of output? So for example, they started thinking about the water usage. Adding more and more filters and more and more treatment process at the end of the pipe was a loser. What if we fix this problem from the beginning? This is a picture of one of their mills in Honduras. What we're looking at in the foreground is an enormous um, lagoon that is actually an eco, uh, ecosystem of solutions actually process water through the mill. This lagoon does the last final uh, set of, of treatments of the process. When finished, the water is actually cleaner than the river that they got it out of, and they use it for agriculture or to refeed the, the same river. But one of the key tricks is not only do they use bioremediation in the whole process for the, at a whole mill scale, creating clean water at lower cost, but what they really do, developed was a thinking about what comes into the mill in the first place? So they redesigned and reformulated the chemistry from the get-go and said, you know what, we're not going to try to filter out bad stuff at the end of the pipe. We're only going to put good stuff in the beginning of the pipe in the first place. And so this uh, organization, Ecotex, maybe some of you heard of it, um, helps to um, certify mills and other processes the, at the chemistry level. They started in Europe um, to help understand what's going into the building in the first place. So here's a really cool solution that actually solved problems better than, um, better than adding filters at the end of the pipe. Another great thing they did at this same facility was to start looking at their energy supply. They use a lot of steam and a lot of electricity to run the mill. The original source of that was to have boilers running off of fuel oil. In fact, number uh, um, Bunker C fuel oil, which was delivered by the barge load to this location. It's a pretty remote location, so now they have problems of getting barges there. They got to pay for all that fuel oil. 
They have spill risks, lots of other exposures, and all the funds, the actual cost of all that oil is leaving the property. They rethought the whole process from the get-go and said, wow, we could be a much better part of this ne network, part of this ecosystem, if we rethink the way we do things. They actually took out the boilers, reinstalled from, from in their, this is a new mill, they built a boiler system based on biomass from the local region. In fact, they created a market for ag waste from the local farm community so that they actually started burning stuff that these guys used to have to pay to throw away. They not only created a better jobs market, better economic market for local farmers, but it was a near free um, fuel supply to run their mill. Neat way to connect the dots. So all of a sudden, they're running on renewable energy from local supply, where the local farmers and the local community actually is directly benefiting from what the, the funds that are going through the process. Really radical rethinking of the entire process from the get-go. Thinking about it from closing the loops. Remember my original diagram of take, make, waste was a single line, and we saw that we could create value, but what if we had a closed loop thinking, and we were creating value all the way around. A lot of folks think that a sustainable business environment would reduce our opportunities as business people or reduce the product productivity of the economy. I would argue that, in fact, thinking about it as a one direction process is missing half of the economy. There's an entire set of value propositions for businesses on the back side of this cycle that we don't even touch today. We're going to create amazing amounts of jobs, new industries, new production processes, new businesses that don't even exist today because we haven't closed the loop. The opportunity is amazing for how much is going to happen in this, in this space. So who's working on this already? Well, yeah, so there's Roundup the usual suspects. But what's interesting, I think, is some folks that you might not have expected who are doing some really good work behind the scenes. Not only our friends at Microsoft, who just became one of the largest um, buyers of renewable energy, but other companies that you might not have expected. And I think that's pretty cool because I think it really indicates that there's something going on here. There's something happening behind the scenes that's really telling us that um, this isn't just a fad, this isn't just a marketing campaign, this isn't just a, a way to think about the process. There's really some thought going on in organizations to really redesign the way they're thinking about things. I think that's pretty exciting. However, it's pretty confusing because we're reinventing almost everything we know about how we did business. What got us here isn't going to get us there. And in fact, it's really interesting. If I was in your shoes, I would find this interesting because what made us successful today to get to here isn't what's going to make us successful in the future. Therefore, 20 years of experience, lots of experience in how to get successful for in the way we do things today is not a very big advantage against somebody with new ideas, a new approach, and a better way to solve problems. That's interesting. Businesses are all over the map. And in fact, it's pretty hard to understand where they are. So it wouldn't be an engineering program um, um, lecture if it didn't have one really complicated chart. <laughs> so I worked all day on this. <laughs> Actually, this is about 10 years worth of, uh, of, of, uh, of experience tried to cram into one chart. And recently it was published um, in a book um, called Making Sustainability Stick by Kevin Wilhelm. He was kind enough to invite me to co-author the chapter on organizational change. What does it look like when we're actually moving organizations from conventional thinking to some eventual state of sustainability? And that's a pretty hard trajectory, in fact, because sustainable is probably not a, an a description of an entity. In fact, it's probably not an individual description at all. There's no such thing as a sustainable thing. There's no, you can't even have a sustainable tree because a tree takes material and has waste. Now, fortunately, we refer to their waste as oxygen, and we're not trying to cap and trade it. Right? We think it's a good thing. So how do you get to this system where waste equals food over there on the right from a system where we're take make waste here on the left. Well, there are several phases of transition that businesses go through. And what's interesting, I think, in this chart is that what we're experiencing is businesses that are starting down this path and are experiencing each phase of this. 
here at the left where we have conventional wisdom, what you see around most companies that I've ever visited are individual heroes or perhaps martyrs, depending on how things are going, who are trying to do the right thing. A good, exp a good example is when I joined REI about a week after, yeah, it was maybe two weeks, got a telephone. I was in charge of sustainability, first person in charge of sustainability and social responsibility at REI. Got a telephone call from Forest Ethics. Now, Forest Ethics is a, a, um, a very active campaign NGO who has done some pretty aggressive campaigning against the likes of Victoria's Secret and others in support of rainforests. And in, in specifically, they were interested in the Canadian boreal forest where a lot of logging was going on. And in fact, a lot of logging that was feeding the catalog industry. And that's why they were after Victoria's Secret. And that's why they were calling us. We shipped a lot of catalogs. And they were wondering how come the catalog that tells them to go hike in the forest is part of the problem for why there is no forest. And I said, darn, that's a good question. <laughs> I really wish I knew the answer to that question. Can you give me a minute? And they were kind enough to buy me a little time. I went searching all over the company. In fact, I found eventually the paper buyer in the marketing department. She was awesome. For at least five years, she had been buying paper with 10% post-consumer recycled content, which at that time was actually really good. It was a really good move. You couldn't get much better than that at that time. But she hadn't never told anybody. Why? Because she paid a little bit more for that paper compared to what she could have been paying for some other paper, and she was scared to death that even at REI, someone would tell her to stop. She was an individual hero committing a random act of greenness. <laughs> there really wasn't much business case for what she was doing. She was kind of acting on intuition, and she was sort of trying to do the right thing, which is awesome if we knew what the right thing was. Fortunately, my experience of sustainability, as soon as we start looking down the road and as soon as you start doing some math, we have no idea what the right thing to do is. It's way too complicated. We have to get a whole new set of metrics in order to understand really how to do the better thing. So random acts of greenness is what's happening in the status quo. What happens in the first phase, or the, we call it phase two here, is that a business starts to recognize that there are lots of reasons why they might really think about environmental and social responsibility in a whole new way and start driving some different outcomes. Now, there's a hundred reasons why they want to do that. They want to sell green products, and pretty soon they recognize that customers who buy green products ask them about their own green behavior first. Who knew? They might be chasing green investors. They might be concerned about activists. They might be concerned about campaign organizations. They may be trying to uh, in, in, engage their employees. There's a hundred reasons why organizations would begin this journey. But what they're all finding as they start is, wow, this starts to make sense. And in fact, in the first stage is the easy stuff we kind of refer to as eco-efficiency. That's the happy coincidence when something is both environmentally better and cost less, turning out the lights, as an example. But pretty soon we start to realize that by changing the way we do things, we can actually redesign outcomes by breaking some rules, collaborating more effectively, understanding the metrics, we actually start to drive bad stuff down. Instead of accelerating with our growth the, as a business, the brown line starts to turn the other way. And when we really start to think about things about differently, we start to create new value propositions in the way we do things in the first place, and the green line starts to climb. We start to actually have environmental and social benefits. And in fact, when we're really getting there, business is more successful when it solves problems versus the their competitors who are causing them. And isn't that an interesting way to think about how to be successful in the next phase of business? So how does this affect you guys? Well, I uh, had the real pleasure of working for Sally Jewell for quite a few years. Um, she's now the Secretary of Interior. And um, I used to get to fly wingman for Sally on several public occasions. One of them was a, a speech she did at an event called Fortune Green. And just before she spoke, this guy spoke. And the guy on the right is, uh, is um, Lee, Lee Scott. There we go. I know my, I know, I know this. I know my speech. I honest, I do. Um, Lee Scott was the uh, former now CEO of Walmart. 
fascinating conversation. He talked about why Walmart had made the shift to thinking about sustainability. Now, you may be skeptical. I agree. They got a million people on the payroll. Not everybody gets it. No question about it. Not every vice president at Walmart gets it. But they've got an amazing scale. You know, if, they're, if Walmart took their business apart in billion dollar segments and put one person in charge of every billion dollars of business that they do, and then they decided to have a meeting and pull all those people together, it would be twice as many people as are in this room. Each one with a billion dollars worth of influ in influence. Pretty incredible scale. Lee, Lee said many really impressive things about why they were doing this. But one of the really impressive observations he made was that every quarter he would have a meeting and he would, op optional meeting, he would bring people from across their campus in Bentonville together and he would talk about some of the initiatives they were taking on around sustainability. And he would have people present and he would have people show what they were done and he would uh, fet some, uh, some success stories and give updates to the entire organization. What he said he noticed was that as he progressed through a couple of years of this, he noticed that the people that were being noticed in that process and the people who were regularly showing up to those meetings were being promoted in the organization faster than their peers. And he had some HR people, because he can do that, he was the CEO, had some HR people do a little longitudinal study, and sure enough, it was true. These people were actually progressing through the organization faster than their, than their peers, their competition, if you will. And he wondered why that was, and he gave a lot of thought to that. And then he said in this talk, then it became completely obvious to him. People who were pursuing thoughts and thinking and implementation around sustainable business ideas were actually doing things better. They were creating more value in their jobs. They were thinking CEO thoughts. They were looking at the organization horizontally and thinking about how to bridge gaps. They were thinking about how to innovate in their jobs. And they were leading with influence instead of authority. They were actually experiencing leadership through the organization. And of course, people with those kinds of qualities are being promoted faster in their business. So I'm going to assert that my hypothesis is that businesses who implement sustainable business thinking will outcompete their competition. They will deliver better value to their owners and to their customers because they're delivering more value. And the first corollary, individuals in those organizations who have these skills and competencies and are able to implement that across their business will themselves be upwardly mobile. It wasn't until just a couple months ago that I realized the second corollary. As I watched uh, Barack Obama introduce my boss as the next Secretary of the Interior, I realized, oh yeah, CEOs who get it are also upwardly mobile. <laughs> I should have seen that coming. So what are some of those skills? All right, this is on the test, <laughs> the life test. Because this is the stuff that really, I think, takes away from where you're, where you're headed. Systems thinking. So not just thinking about the, the, the linear progression of things, but thinking about the way things work in systems. There's a whole new set of metrics for business. We used to think counting carbon was sort of a green thing on the side. Not true anymore. That's really a business indicator. In fact, it's a forward-looking indicator a lot of times where some of the traditional business metrics we have are rearward-looking and not very helpful at all. In fact, sales can re often be a rearward-looking, lagging indicator where carbon understanding, as was quoted our, uh, the REI's logistics vice president, says that understanding the, the carbon intensity of the supply chain is a better indicator of efficiency than understanding cost. Because people haven't figured out how to game it yet. <laughs> Nobody can hide the fossil fuels in the supply chain yet. So that's why he, he, he has a whole group of people working on what's the carbon intensity of his supply chain. An interdisciplinary understanding, looking across the organization and being able to influence across the organization. Being able to collaborate internally and externally to the organization is an entire set of skills that is incredibly valuable. And finally, being able to re lead through influence rather than authority. By the way, if you're taking notes, I'm not going to stereotype too gra graphically here, but 
many of these qualities tend to be feminine, which is an interesting indicator of some of the success I've seen of my colleagues around the industry who are women who are leading sustainability efforts across, the, across major corporations. So what are your to-dos? As you leave here, here's the to-dos. One, ask for more sustainable business content in your current classwork. Yes, I'm openly advocating for insurrection. <laughs> if you're not getting this material, you are behind folks who do. And here's my, my, my dad had a great comment once. You know, I wasn't that academically rigorous as an undergraduate. My dad took me aside one day and he said, Kevin, just because you can fall down does not mean you have a sufficient grasp of gravity that you can cut physics. <laughs> he was right. It was a lot harder than I thought it was once I got into math. So just because you have this sense of, of, uh, of, of doing the right thing, all the work we've done over the last decade has proven that we really don't know what the right thing is. There's rigor, there's academic material, and now there's a body of literature, case study, and research that you should be tapping into to be able to gain the skills and competencies that are going to make you more successful in your first job or your next job. Second, when you interview, by the way, you are the best and brightest. Trust me, that's what folks out there think. When you interview, ask questions about the CSR strategy of the business that you're joining. Not because you're a tree hugger, but you want to know if they're going to be around very long. And I argue that if they're not doing much around sustainability, if they don't have a sustainable business strategy that goes a lot fast, we support carpooling and we recycle at the office, that business is in challenge. Or you could represent that as a, a big opportunity for you. you Kind of depends on where you come from, but you may see. But that's a really important question to ask a future employer. Don't accept trade-offs in your work. Look for the innovation. Be the innovator. Drive opportunity because you didn't accept the way it's always been. Drive the innovation and create more value. Be the agent of change in your organization because you are the change. You have the opportunity to use new skills and competencies to drive business to. Un, be unknown outcomes, places where the business can be part of the solution, and places that we're going to get amazing results that we've never seen before. In fact, you're part of the prospiracy. There you go. That's my, uh, that's my thoughts. Thank you.